So we'll start off with the basics, right? So um, this is a motor neuron. So you have a cell body and an axon, which is originating from the cell body. And it is in this distal end of the axon, uh, which synapses with the skeletal muscle motor end plate. Right, so further to basics, where do you get these motor neurons? Now the motor neurons can be at the uh, motor cortex, whose axons descend down along the spinal cord, and they would end at the spinal cord or would end at the brainstem. So they would travel along the corticospinal tract or the corticobulbar tract. So that's the upper motor neuron. Then you also get the lower motor neurons whose cell bodies lie at the spinal cord uh, or at the brain stem and their axons innervate the skeletal muscle. So you have the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons. So with that in our minds, uh, we'll move on to the uh, objectives of today's talk. So I'll be talking to you about what motor neuron disease is about. Uh, pathophysiology, then uh, classification, a practical classification system, uh, then uh, the uh, main clinical features, uh, how you would arrive at a diagnosis, what's the prognosis uh, in motor neuron disease, and finally about the management. So motor neuron disease, uh, it's uh, where you get the destruction of the motor neurons, uh, which results in loss of voluntary muscle function. Now, uh, the manifestations would depend on the type of motor neurons and where these motor neurons are being affected. So uh, there would be selective uh, loss of voluntary muscle function depending on the motor neurons that are affected. Uh, so in our uh, webinar series, we were trying to uh, identify important, 10 important points, what you call pearls, right along these uh, series. Uh, so in my talk also, I have uh, tried to um, highlight some important points. Uh, so motor neuron disease, you get a selective loss of voluntary muscle function. So this is a progressive uh, disorder with a median survival of around three to five years. Uh, it's a disease where the onset occurs at the elderly, uh, usually in the sixth decade, and the risk increases by, say, around till around 75 years. Uh, this is the third commonest neurodegenerative disorder, but having said that, the incidence itself on it, it's uh, rather rare. And this is largely a sporadic disease, where the uh, familial cases account for around 5 to 10%. And uh, out of these familial cases, the inheritance is commonly uh, autosomal dominant. So the points to remember here, it's a disease of elderly commonly, I say commonly, uh, and this is largely sporadic. So it will be important to remember this because uh, the family members might come and ask you about the inheritance. So uh, it's good to remember that this is largely sporadic and uh, the familial uh, inheritance occurs only in around five to 10%. Okay, so let's move on to the classification. Uh, you've seen this diagram before. Uh, the classification again is based on the type of motor neuron that is affected. Uh, so you have the upper motor neuron isolated involvement, what you call pure upper motor neuron involvement. Then there could be the uh, pure lower motor neuron involvement. Uh, or there could be the combined upper and lower motor neuron involvement. The uh, pure upper motor involvement is the rarest out of all. It uh, accounts for around uh, 1%. Uh, example is progress progressive lateral sclerosis. Then uh, pure lower motor involvement, uh, you get around 10% out of all the MD, uh, MNDs, uh, where you get uh, the progressive muscular atrophy. Uh, spinal muscular atrophies uh, as um, subtypes of pure uh, lower motor neuron involvement. Then the commonest out of all MND is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, where there is combined upper motor and lower motor involvement. And this accounts for around 85%. So uh, practical classification, 
uh, involving the subtypes of MND would be based on the type of motor neurons that are involved, upper motor, lower motor, or combination. Okay, so let's move on to the pathophysiology. Uh, so in here, there is a degeneration and destruction and death of motor neurons. And subsequently, uh, and uh, so this occurs in the upper motor neurons as well as in the lower motor neurons. Uh, subsequently, the uh, axonal loss and gliosis occurs. So that occurs along the uh, spinal cord tracts as well as in the peripheral motor nerve. Uh, finally, there would be denervation atrophy of the affected skeletal muscle. So there are uh, many mechanisms that have been postulated as giving rise to this uh, pathophysiology, like um, accumulation of oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, glutamate excitotoxicity. So there are many postulated mechanisms. Uh, so the importance of these mechanisms is that uh, the uh, treatment modalities uh, have attempted to address these mechanisms. Then what are the risk factors? Uh, oh, well, uh, now uh, this is commonly a disease of elderly. So advancing age, I said till around 75 uh, years of age, the risk increases. And uh, positive family history uh, in ones who have uh, uh, family, uh, family members being affected would be uh, risk factors. Uh, then there are various other factors which have been uh, shown in small epidemiological studies as being uh, involved, like uh, intense physical activity, um, uh, slimness, uh, then uh, long years of military service, smoking. So these are some of the other factors which show uh, some association with MND uh, causation. Okay, so with that, we'll move on to the commonest uh, type of uh, motor neuron disease, which is uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, so actually now, if you go through the literature, now in, um, in uh, US literature, uh, ALS, it's used synonymously, almost synonymously with MND. Uh, whereas in UK, uh, MND is rather an umbrella term and uh, ALS comes under that. Okay, so uh, what does uh, ALS stand for? Uh, amyotrophic, so A means no loss, myo means muscle, trophic means growth. So there is uh, atrophy of muscle. Then lateral stands for the lateral corticospinal, sclerosis is thickening or fibrosis. So the name implies, uh, gives you an understanding as to what's going on in ALS. So this is the commonest of all and uh, five to 10% are familiar with a commoner uh, inheritance being autosomal dominant inheritance. Uh, so now you saw there in, in this, there is loss of function of upper motor as well as lower motor neurons. Now, depending on the uh, anatomical location of these motor neurons that are affected, uh, the manifestations would involve the limb muscles, bulb muscles or the respiratory muscles. Uh, another important thing to remember in ALS is that this condition is relentlessly, variably progressive. Uh, this may not apply, the term relentlessly may not apply for all the uh, subtypes of MNGs. Uh, for example, conditions like DSMA will not be, uh, it, it will progress for uh, some years, but it will, the progression will arrest on its own. Whereas when you talk about ALS, it, prog it starts from one region and it progresses uh, onto other regions and it progresses right till the death. Uh, the median survival of ALS is around three years from the onset of weakness. So I say it's a median survival, it could be less or uh, there uh, have been reported cases where patients have been functionally uh, intact even until 10 years from the initial diagnosis. Uh, so the early symptoms of ALS could be cramps and fatigue. So again, it's important to remember this because uh, uh, whoever who comes up with cramps and fatigue, it's important to remember this and to uh, have follow-up because the clinical features that I'm going to explain you next will not be apparent at this, this stage. Okay, so you have a pearl here. ALS is a relentlessly progressive 
condition. Right, so what are the clinical features of ALS? So again, uh, let me repeat, ALS has both upper and lower motor neuron involvement, and the manifestations would depend on the uh, anatomical location of these motor neurons that are affected. So the commoner uh, manifestations would be limb onset. Uh, next commoner would be bulbar onset, and respiratory onset would be not so common. Then what are the features of limb onset? Uh, one would get wasting, weakness, fasciculation. So those are the lower motor uh, neuron involvement uh, manifestations. Then there would be brisk reflexes and extensor plantar response, which are the upper motor manifestations. Similarly, you can get the combination of upper motor and lower motor in the bulb onset variety also, dysarthria, dysphagia, wasted tongue with fasciculations, spastic tongue with a spastic dysarthria uh, and brisk jaw jerk. Respiratory onset will have respiratory manifestations, shortness of breath or orthopnea. And importantly, it's, uh, it's, uh, you need to explore about nocturnal, sleep, uh, nocturnal uh, respiration related manifestations to identify uh, nocturnal um, desaturation. Right, so in ALS, what you get is a combination of upper and lower motor neuron signs in multiple regions. Uh, so not only these motor manifestations, you also get effect uh, related manifestations in ALS uh, with emotional lability. And also you get cognitive dysfunction. Uh, so cognitive dysfunction uh, may not be grossly apparent as in uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, but if you explore uh, further, I mean, there would be subtle executive dysfunction in uh, most of these patients. Okay, uh, so when uh, considering the clinical features in ALS, uh, so there are important negatives that you should also consider. Uh, you don't get extraocular muscle involvement in ALS. You don't get sphincter involvement. There are no sensory, there are no heart sensory signs uh, because this is a disorder of motor neurons. And you usually don't get, I use the term usually, you do usually don't get extrapyramidal and cerebellar signs. So it's important to consider these uh, negatives when um, evaluating a patient suspected as having ALS. Okay, so let me show you some pictures. So now here you see um, an atrophic tongue here um, in this patient. So, um, okay, so uh, here the, in the hands, uh, you see, again, uh, there is atrophy. So if you look at the dorsum of the hands, you see the dorsal guttering. So this is because of um, wasting of the dorsal enterocyte. Uh, so it's quite uh, an interesting phenomenon here. You see the guttering, it's preferential. See the guttering, it's more marked at the first dorsal interocyte. Then again, if you look at the uh, palmar aspect of the hand, uh, the wasting is more marked at the thin eminence because of the involvement of the abductor pollicis brevis muscle. So these involve the pincer grasp, pincer grasp of the patient. So you call it these uh, predominant uh, uh, ulna uh, involvement, ulna side involvement of these muscles, uh, you call it the split hand, split hand sign in uh, MND oil. Right, so uh, this video will see the fasciculation. So you can see the fasciculations here. An important thing to note in these fasciculations uh, in ALS, uh, or in MND, you will see generalized fasciculation. So they might not be confined to the muscles uh, which show wasting or weakness. Okay, so here, uh, this is to show you the uh, fasciculations uh, in the tongue. Uh, so tongue fasciculations are best uh, observed uh, when the tongue is uh, inside the uh, flow of the mouth. So you don't get the patient to protrude out to look for fasciculations. 
Right. So, uh, what are the investigations uh, that uh, you would request in ALS? Uh, so, the most important would be the electrodiagnostic studies. So, in electrodiagnostic studies, um, uh, you need to uh, see uh, normal sensory responses in the nerve conduction studies with uh, reduced uh, motor amplitude. So, there can be abnormalities in the motor conduction. The characteristic uh, findings would be obtained from the needle EMG. Uh, where you would see uh, the presence of active and chronic denervation with uh, giant motor unit action potentials. Then uh, if suspicious, it's important to rule out any compressive lesions in the cervical spinal cord, which gives rise to combination of upper and lower motor neuron pattern. So uh, there are the cervical spine MRI would uh, come in handy uh, because uh, these are uh, potentially treatable alternative causes. So needle EMG is the most important investigation in whoever who is suspected as having ALS, uh, need to look for evidence of active and chronic denervation. Okay, so uh, what are the differential diagnosis of ALS? Uh, now again, to remind you that in ALS, there's combination of upper and lower motor involvement. So, uh, in uh, the, so the commonest uh, differential would be uh, radicular myelopathy. So, if there is any compression occurring over the spinal cord as well as on the roots, so you get a combination of upper motor and lower motor patterns. So, you can get this in degenerative bone disorders as well as in uh, spinal meds. Then there is another uh, rather a rare entity, what you call monomely amyotrophy or Hirayama disease. Uh, so this, it's uh, a disorder uh, of, uh, of the young, generally it presents around in a 20 years of age uh, with asymmetrical uh, wasting and weakness of uh, distal hand muscles. So there, that is due to posterior displacement of the dura uh, and of uh, the lower cervical and upper thoracic segments. And this you can uh, see in the MRI uh, neck flexion MRI, you would see the abnormality. Okay, so how would you arrive at a diagnosis of ALS? Uh, so this is why the history, the relentlessly progressive nature and the examination and electrodiagnostic studies uh, demonstrating the presence of upper and lower motor neuron uh, involvement. And also it's important to uh, exclude uh, other uh, possible alternatives uh, which are potentially treatable, which could give rise to the same uh, clinical picture. Uh, so to make this diagnosis of ALS, to make it further precise, considering its grave prognosis, there are various diagnostic criteria which are being laid down. Uh, the revised ls Coriel and Avaji diagnostic criteria uh, mentions uh, the uh, presence of clinical or EMG evidence of lower and upper motor neuron signs in more than three regions. So when I say regions, uh, it could be the cervical, thoracic, uh, lumbar sacral, or the bulba involvement. Okay, so uh, what about the prognosis of MND? So the prognosis is variable. So you saw that there are uh, multiple types that are uh, involved in MND. So the prognosis is variable. Generally, 50% of patients are dead in two to three years. Uh, in ALS, most of these patients die in around three years of diagnosis. So that is the importance of uh, having a precise diagnosis um, when such patients present here. So there are uh, various factors which have demonstrated a favorable survival uh, for example, younger age at symptom onset, uh, longer delay from so that where this uh, disease progression is relatively slower uh, and the uh, intact uh, functional rate, uh, higher functional rating scores and uh, force vital capacity at presentation. Then the limb onset rather than bulb uh, onset symptoms uh, relatively have a favorable course. Uh, the progressive lateral sclerosis, if you remember, uh, I said that there is a, a pure upper motor neuron pattern of MND. Uh, there are the uh, 
uh, progression is very slow and the um, patients would survive for decades. Okay, so let's move on to the management of MND. Uh, so the management uh, at present is based on symptom-based palliation. There are certain disease-modifying therapies, so two such therapies are approved in US, Riluzol and uh, Ederivon, uh, but uh, largely the management is based on symptoms. Uh, so I thought of uh, reminding about the SPIKES protocol because uh, now having uh, established a diagnosis of ALS, uh, it would be a daunting task for the clinician to break the news. Uh, so perhaps um, the SPIKES protocol where it talks about the setting, perception, invitation, then uh, the knowledge, dissemination of information, then explore patient's emotion, be empathic, strategize and uh, summarize. So this spikes protocol would be somewhat helpful when you're breaking the bad news. Okay, so this symptomatic management uh, in MND uh, involves a multidisciplinary team. So uh, studies have shown that a multidisciplinary team approach uh, is helpful uh, in improving the quality as well as in improving the survival. Uh, Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is an option in symptom-based management, um, particularly for patients who have uh, nocturnal desaturation. Uh, so this can be demonstrated by uh, polysomnography. Uh, this non-invasive positive pressure ventilation has shown to improve survival and the quality both. Uh, then patients with uh, predominant bulb onset uh, presentation uh, with uh, rest of the neurology being largely intact, uh, there could, uh, and also based on the patient's autonomy, uh, there would be a place for uh, tracheostomy and invasive ventilation. So those are options. Then what are the symptom-based management? So there can be non-pharmacological and pharmacological methods. Uh, so it's very important to assess these patients on an individual basis and identify the problems that they are undergoing. Uh, and based on the facilities that are available, uh, implement a management plan. So um, weight loss uh, is uh, known to occur even before dysphagia sets in. So serial body weights, it's uh, very important. Uh, so there can be measures like alteration of food consistencies, uh, uh, opinion by the uh, nutritionists or the dietitians would be helpful. Uh, then um, uh, peg tube insertion uh, would can be considered uh, when there is progressive weight loss. So say by around uh, around ten percent of weight loss. So that would be uh, vital capacity being more than fifty percent. Uh, that would be the time to uh, think of a PEG tube. Then spasticity uh, can be managed by uh, muscle relaxants, uh, baclofen, tizanidine, so would be options. Uh, then uh, another important thing which I wanted to uh, highlight here is that not only the uh, motor manifestations, not only wasting weakness, spasticity cramps, uh, but also it's important to address about the uh, psychological issues of the patients, which are common in these sort of patients, because that is, a, so we are talking about a symptom-based management uh, with, uh, in order to improve the uh, quality of life. Uh, so this uh, psychological management, uh, it it's, uh, plays an important uh, entity there. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on to the end of this uh, talk. So let me uh, summarize uh, the pearls we've been gathering uh, right along. So motor neuron disease, it's, uh, you get a selective loss of voluntary muscle function, uh, which is a neurodegenerative disease, largely sporadic, which is around five to 10% being familial. There are multiple subtypes depending on the types of motor neurons that are affected, whether they are upper motor, lower motor, or combination. ALS is the uh, commonest subtype of motor neuron disease, accounting for around 85%, uh, which is a relentlessly progressive disorder. And here you get combination of upper motor and lower motor in multiple regions.
talking about investigations, needle EMG is the most useful uh, in order to demonstrate evidence of active and chronic denervation. Uh, so there are important negatives uh, when, uh, that you need to consider when diagnosing MND, uh, like the absence of a hard sensory signs, uh, there is no uh, extraocular muscle involvement, and there is no sphincter involvement. Uh, putting them all together, the ALS diagnosis should be absolutely precise considering its grave prognosis. And finally, uh, motor neuron uh, management at present is largely symptom and palliative care based and uh, best that it carries on with the multidisciplinary team care.